in this panel. I am delighted to have three distinguished scholars to join me on stage. Uh, from your left to your right is Dr. Kyle Soska. He's the head of research at Ramiel Capital. He got his PhD in electrical and computer engineering from CMU in 2021 and was a postdoctoral scholar at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, with uh, Professor Andrew Miller that we just heard from a minute ago. Uh, next is Dr. Taiwan Kim, who is an associate professor of business ethics uh, here at CMU in this building, in the Tepper School of Business. Prior to joining Tepper's faculty in 2012, uh, Taiwan Kim did his PhD in the Department of Legal Studies and Business Ethics at Wharton, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Taiwan Kim is also on the editorial boards of Business Ethics Quarterly and of the Journal of Business Ethics. And finally, uh, sitting next to me is Dr. Martin Saint, Director of Academics and Distinguished Service Professor at CMU Africa in Kigali, Rwanda. Um, Martin taught the first academic financial technology and blockchain courses on the whole African continent and received his MS and PhD in computer systems, uh, networking and telecommunications from the TCP program that stands for Technology, Cybersecurity and Policy in computer science at the University of Colorado. So uh, welcome to uh, all three of our um, panelists. We have approximately 50 minutes total. We are going to try to make this interactive. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna uh, start by asking questions. Uh, feel free to heckle, interject, vociferously disagree with our panelists. Um, they are here for that. So I'm gonna start with kind of the elephant in the room, which I uh, had to kind of answer to some folks when uh, we decided to start this, uh, this initiative. And um, it's, the, it's the following question. So cryptocurrencies and blockchain technologies have gotten a pretty bad name uh, in the past couple of years due to some notorious high profile cases. I mean, unless you slept under a rock, You've heard about FTX. In fact, we've talked about FTX probably five times in this um, uh, conference. Uh, the Terra Luna meltdown and many others. And even before that, it wasn't, you know, all unicorns and, uh, and, and uh, roses. Um, crypto was used primarily as a currency on marketplaces like Silk Road. So, which sold drugs, uh, in case you don't know. Uh, so this has led some academics to famously state that the entire research area should, I quote, this is not my quote, this is, somebody say that, uh, should die in a fire. Um, and yet here we are, right? So can you outline for you, and I'm asking that to all of our panelists, the major reason why it is still a well-worthy area of research. Why are we doing this? And I'll start with Kyle. Well, I think it's a very complicated uh, sort of thing that happened in the last year or two where a lot of harm came to people for various reasons. So, for example, FTX, Celsius, BlockFi, these are like conventional frauds. The, the, these are frauds that happen to have enjoyed like being tangentially related to cryptocurrency, but very little of what actually happened to them is related to the technology itself. On the other hand, you have things like Luna, which also created a tremendous amount of harm, which was exactly related to cryptocurrency. And I think that it's really a fallacy of experimenting, running live at mass experiments with real money on the mainnet. And when it works out, people enjoy a lot of price appreciation. Things are good. You get in early on technology. And when it doesn't go well, people sort of lose their financial livelihood. And I think what we saw is a, a big failure of a lot of traditional frauds, but also things that were sort of endorsed as being safe because we hadn't had any recent reminders of something catastrophic happening. So when I pick it apart, I don't blame cryptocurrency per se for a lot of what happened. I do blame sort of the boldness with which people experimented on mainnet to an extent, though. Oh, thank you. Taiwan? So uh, I, I think some of the asymmetry uh, uh, is generating some concern from the public about uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, for instance, Wall Street has bad name. Finance has bad name. And economics has bad name. And I teach all of them in case studies. But... Uh, there's a lot of research and uh, literature about business ethics uh, and regulatory uh, approaches. 
And also, uh, in the context of AI, artificial intelligence, ChatGPT, uh, the public is worried about uh, it. However, at the same time, recently we've seen uh, a fast-growing amount of literature about uh, fairness algorithms explained by AI. Uh, interestingly, in the domain of blockchain and cryptocurrency, we do not see enough number of PhD students, for instance, working on blockchain ethics or cryptocurrency ethics. So I think this may be a reason uh, why uh, the public has some uh, lack of understanding about what's going on. At the same time, I think this is an opportunity for PhDs and other uh, involved researchers to think about new research questions in the domain of blockchain and cryptocurrency. For instance, uh, I will be short, you know. So some people ask the question about networks regulations as opposed to policy and external regulations. And policy, external regulations may be some policy issues, but networks and internal uh, regulation, those are very important ethics issues and political philosophy issues. So, you know, we can think about, for instance, a voting theory about, you know, uh, one vote to one person or one vote to the number of shares or uh, coins you have. This is basically corporation model. The other model we can think about is co-op model. However, how many you, no matter what the number of uh, uh, coins you have, you have only one vote. There are a bunch of different types of you know, voting theories about which one is a fair algorithm, which one is a fair doubt, which one is a, can be developed. And I see some in interesting convergence between humanities, including philosophy, ethics, and political science, and cryptocurrency and blockchain, which I don't see a real substantive approach. Thank you. Um, and, and Martin, your take on this? Well, <clears throat> Nicholas, did, did you really imply there might be some problems? I alluded to it, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so... You know, as researchers, one of the very first things we're looking for is a research problem. It kind of indicates we ought to go forward, not back. And, uh, and you mentioned, you know, blockchain and cryptocurrencies, which are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. And if the whole research area should burn in a fire, where do we start and where do we stop? So uh, back in, I think, about 2012, I was doing some work with Idaho National Labs. Uh, it's kind of the, uh, the lab that's charged with critical infrastructure protection for the United States, things like the electric grid and emergency services. And so I'm reading all these blogs uh, on security and this cryptocurrency... Uh, you know, blockchain thing kept coming up, and I ignored it for a while. But you started to see it enough times to see enough elements that I'm like, you know, some of this stuff actually sounds cool. There's cryptography in here. There's economics. There's monetary theory. There's game theory. There's mechanism design. There's even anarchy. <clears throat> and it really sounded like fun. So I started looking into it more. And if we're going to burn the whole research area, I mean, are, are we just going to quit doing work in cryptography? Um, so, you know, problems are good. Uh, it's why we're going to get up in the morning and why we've got things to do. Uh, and at the same time, a healthy amount of skepticism is good. Uh, a lot of people ask me, you know, should I invent or invest in crypto or how can I get rich? And, and, you know, since the beginning, I've said, look, this is not a place where consumers should be speculating. Uh, there are probably a lot of good applications of this technology, but that isn't one of the things that I would suggest doing with it. So I think that the, the takeaway that I get if I, if I go across all three of your answers is that um, the whole blockchain and or cryptocurrency ecosystem is great because uh, for research because it mixes a bunch of different um, underlying scientific advances ranging from distributed, uh, distributed systems, sorry, to uh, ethics, to distributed governance, to cryptography, to finance even. And at the same time, per what Kyle was saying earlier, we are putting everything on the mainnet where people are actually 
multiplying with real money. So we have an ecologically valid environment where people actually, you know, have some skin in the game to uh, to, to use a commonly um, used phrase. So that leads me to, um, to to the next question. I mean, I, you, you all convinced me that, okay, we're not wasting our time. We are <laughs> studying something that is worth studying. Um, but, you know, again, to be a little bit the devil's advocate, uh, those cryptocurrency skeptics, they, they do make a good point, right? I mean, there's been a number of fraud and problems that, ha- that have occurred. Um, and I was wondering if you have any thoughts on the possible scientific or other, actually, regulatory uh, mitigations that can, be, uh, that, that can be used to mitigate those very real harms that cryptocurrency skeptics have, have outlined. And I, I will start by uh, asking Dr. Kim. So... So uh, I think I know uh, Soska, right? Soska made a great distinction between a uh, distinctive problem, a problem distinctive to cryptocurrency or blockchain in general, and, and problems not distinctive to blockchain. For instance, uh, I think many of the uh, challenges, accusations made against uh, blockchain uh, cryptocurrencies are actually not distinctive to those two things. One example that from my personal experience is one of my MBA students I taught a couple of years ago who uh, probably got a very uh, decent final grade from my ethics class uh, was arrested. He was the uh, product manager in uh, Coinbase. He was, uh, so the problem was it was a wire fraud. Okay? So wire fraud, it has nothing to do with any internal architecture of the models. It is a behavior problem, okay? and then but it we see that it is a behavior problem and a fraud, and then uh, newspapers want to emphasize, wow, there is some technology nobody understands, but here is a serious problem. That's one thing. Second problem is that SEC needs to define whether some p- cryptocurrencies are security or not. It's their problem. It's not our problem. It's so, so if they with a reasonable ground that decides that, okay, some of them are securities, then uh, communities will modify uh, their products and uh, uh, architectures to abide by the SEC's rules. So I think here, one thing I still see is that the asymmetry between the public and the industry. The public and even including government regulators do not have at least some understanding of what's going on here. And that makes they fear about these products. And then, also, so therefore, I think one great approach I highly recommend to the industry uh, leaders is to uh, provide some very accessible <laughs> approach to the public and uh, even government uh, regulators. There must be some, because practically it is very difficult for government regulators to hire people have a good understanding of blockchain, some people like you, because government salary is a lot lower than the employers work with you. So therefore, it is practically very difficult for the government to have great expertise. Unless you reach out to them, teach them this is what's going on, they won't have a great understanding. So therefore, there will be some miscommunication always, and there will be risk toward each other. Thank you. Martin? Refresh me on the question. <laughs> what are possible scientific or um, regulatory mitigations? I guess we'll have a question about regulations in a second, but uh, scientific mitigations to the very real harms that cryptocurrency skeptics are, you know, outlining and, in fact, forcefully outlining in some yeah. cases. So, <clears throat> I mean, if, I don't mean to avoid the question, but I, I, we can't summarize it. And that's kind of the, I think, the issue. Um, There certainly are very real harms, and skeptics are great. And people that are pointing out the potential harms or the potential issues or problems are great. Um, But they're not the same problem, and they're not addressed the same way. And, you know, certain things, I think most people agree in principle are important, like consumer protection. And we might say that 
we need to look at consumer protection and say, do we need new regulations? Do we need a different way to apply existing regulations? Do we need somehow more information or education about what's there? Uh, and, and that's a good principle. Um, but I think that there are so many distinct and interesting problems because we're talking about um, so many different applications and so many different technologies that you really have to focus in on a specific problem that's been identified or try to identify a new problem. And then you look at what is the best mitigation for that problem. And I, I think we need to go about it that way uh, rather than trying to make very broad statements. And I'll, I'll just point out, uh, you know, especially a few years ago uh, in Africa, a lot of the governments were thinking about uh, this cryptocurrency and blockchain thing. And like all regulators, you know, first they don't know about it, and then they hear about it. And the first thing they do is, well, let's just not allow it because we don't understand what it is. And, you know, there were these crazy statements like, well, you know, let's just not allow blockchains, right? And, uh, and on one level, it's a data structure. I'm like, you know, would, would you outlaw linked lists? Would you, would you say, you know, spreadsheets are a bad idea because, uh, you know, somebody idea. might be tracking money laundering on a spreadsheet? So, um, you know, you, you got to pick your problem and you got to pick the appropriate solution. But it, you can't really answer it in the... Uh, Broad way, right? Yeah. So, so I guess there isn't a single solution. Basically, is, is what uh, you're, you're saying, Kyle? You... Yeah. So, with respect to the harm created, I think that we as researchers need to be extremely thoughtful about the message that we're sending to people. Right? There's a lot of commentary on cryptocurrency online. You can go to Twitter and find you know a million opinions a day. But as somebody who's a member or a faculty member of a university like Carnegie Mellon, your word carries a little more weight. Um, or, or any institution that you represent. And it's important that we be very, very thoughtful about the message that we're sending to the public. For example, uh, you know, if you give a talk and you say, look, here's a, a consensus algorithm. It has very nice properties. It satisfies certain criteria. And your slides have like some kind of cryptocurrency project logo in the corner. And you're espousing all the wonderful consensus mechanisms and properties here. If you're not careful, that's taken as a blanket endorsement of this project. And what you're saying is more nuanced. What you're saying is there is a technical contribution here that's very interesting. You're not saying rush out and buy this currency. But people are desperate to look for, oh, so-and-so important, thoughtful, you know, reputable person has endorsed this thing. And that matters quite a bit. So I think that we as a community need to be very thoughtful about the messages that we're sending um, to, to not you know, misconstrue our intentions of developing this technology for investment advice, um, because that's quite literally what people are looking for. Um, to the second part, in terms of what we can do from a regulatory point of view, something stands out to me pretty substantially over the last year, which is that there's this friction between this like very much you have complete autonomy over your wallet and your funds and code is law and computers rule everything kind of world of cryptocurrency, and sort of a very walled garden that we live in in the real world, where the FDA makes sure that I can't go to the grocery store and buy like a poisonous cucumber, and that my car has passed uh, numerous kinds of checks and regulations to make sure it's safe, and the places that I live in are zoned appropriately, and the water is safe to drink. And I, I don't actively think about the kinds of things that could hurt me on a daily basis. And yet, once you go into the cryptocurrency world, all, all bets are off. Uh, I gave a talk at UIUC last year called Should My Mom Trade Crypto? And it made the case that DeFi is the single most dangerous financial landscape that we have ever created. You, you have a lot of power, but with a lot of power comes the potential to do a lot of harm. And so what's happened is that people have basically blanket invested into companies like FTX, like Celsius, like BlockFi, expecting the kinds of safeguards with the expectation of the kinds of regulation that they enjoy at their personal bank. And this is very apparently not what has happened. So I think that, and I'm not coming down on one side or the other, saying that I, I favor a world in which people are sort of more self-responsible or one where government looks out for its citizens and its sort of you know, vulnerable groups. But 
I think that we need to be very clear about what the expectation is when people get into cryptocurrency, because that expectation has been substantially violated in the last year. Yeah, so that's that's a very interesting point, actually, which is a nice segue to the uh, the last question that I had that you you actually uh, I guess partially answered from from your standpoint, which is. Do we really need new regulations for, uh, and I'm thinking in particular about cryptocurrencies here more than the whole blockchain ecosystem, or can existing regulations uh, already serve that purpose, right? I mean, if you look at um, the U.S. legal code, it's already like hundreds of pages long. Do we need to add more regulations, or can we just use some of those uh, existing regulations and just say, hey, you know, crypto fall, falls under that bucket. And that's kind of what, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but that's kind of what uh, Treasury has been doing and FinCEN has been doing by issuing some clarifications. So should we expect more of that or do we really need a fundamentally different um, approach and maybe a set of new regulations that take into account the idiosyncrasies of, um, of that ecosystem? So I'll, I'll start by asking uh, Martin. So I, I think, again, you have to start kind of by picking your problem or addressing your problem. And uh, the regulations that might apply to blockchain are not necessarily the same regulations that might apply to cryptocurrency. And the regulations that might apply to a blockchain-based land registry are not necessarily the same regulations that need to apply to international money transfers or something like that. Uh, so the you know the place to start is clearly to look at the existing regulations and what they're designed to do, and uh, it's pretty clear that in the ecosystem there are issues and we don't have enough consumer protection. So we need to find a way to get more consumer protection in the system, and a good way to do that is to start with the existing regulations. Um, I, you know, I, I've been in Africa for about 10 years, and uh, in one of my previous lives, I ran a company that pretty much built data centers and telephone central offices, and there's a building code, and there's a fire code, and there's electrical code, and there's a mechanical code, and it's this huge stack of books. And in Africa, they have none of that, um, and, and it runs pretty well with almost no regulation. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure more is necessarily better, and that isn't the first place that I would look. But there are clear problems like consumer protection that we need to do more than we're doing now. Thank you. Kyle, do you want to revisit your earlier answer add to it? Yeah, I think consumer protection is number one. If you are an entity that custodies money on behalf of a consumer, you should be regulated. You should have that consumer's interest in mind, and there should be some body watching over you to make sure you're responsible. Um, that, I think, is first and foremost. The second thing, and this is kind of the touchy one right now, is if you issue tokens as a form of raising capital, what are you, right? And you're sort of making or creating this expectation that you're looking after the people who are buying these tokens from you, and yet there is no legal accountability. You can just disappear off into the sunset, and nobody will come after you because you have not made a legal obligation to anybody, and traditionally, this would be a security offering, and it seems in most cases that coins that are issued for the purposes of raising capital as a form of sort of equity are securities. And I think that that will clear up a lot of things. It's going to be very painful because the lack of any sort of friction has enabled an explosion of very small startups to fund themselves. And, and a lot of people will contend that if you add a barrier to registration and compliance, it's going to kill a lot of these ideas. And I rebut that it's going to kill a lot of the bad ideas. And the good ideas are going to overcome that barrier. Um, so I think that those are the two big things that I would look for for regulation. But consumer protection is by far number one. Anyone? Yeah. Uh, I agree with both of them, uh, both of the uh, speaker uh, panelists' ideas. And uh, for the external policy based, uh, regulations, I uh, probably, uh, the question is not whether we need a new statute or a case, but whether we need to use this existing statute to blockchain-based uh, products. So 
You know, if you use blockchain to kill a certain person, that's wrong. If you use blockchain to make a fraudulent statement, that's wrong. Basically, you know, we have many ideas already existing. In a, uh, and uh, if some existing consumer protection base uh, uh, has not been used to protect uh, consumers in this area, then we need to make a decision about uh, help. But I am more interested in the internal networks. So to realize the real philosophical idea behind this whole uh, movement, autonomous, decentralized network, if it's possible. And then especially through DAO, and we need some ground grounding words to have uh, and internally without uh, there must there will be always government uh, regulations. But even before they came into uh, the processes and uh, 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 penalism, I think we need to think about some grounding words about how to make this uh, network fair. How to this network uh, ethical and responsible? And I actually see. You, countless philosophical issues here. So many. Even it's, uh, it's very similar to the uh, early uh, political philosophers like Hobbes or Locke. They thought about the state of nature. The blockchain is the state of nature. Nobody owns anything. And we need to define what property means in this network. And then who owns what and what grounding rules should we have? And voting rules, who should be the decision makers or not? And for this aspect, I think some new set of rules and uh, ideas must be generated. Oh, thank you. That's, so that's, I, I, I agree with everything that's been said, uh, but I'm going to pick a little bit. Um, a lot of the fraudulent coins that we've seen you know, in the past year or so, they reminded me very, very eerily of the failed ICOs of like four years ago. It's exactly the same thing. The, technical, the technological mechanism may be a little bit different, but regulatory, I don't think that there's a lot of difference. And it doesn't seem like we are learning a lot from those past bad events. I mean, there were frauds five years ago with ICOs. Five years ago, yeah, about five years ago. Uh, and now we've got, you know, rug pulls from the Squid Game coin or whatever, you know, whatever... Um, uh, rug pull you want to uh, to think about. So are we somewhat blinded or by, by you know, the promises of technology? Or is it more that, well, um, the long arm of the law moves, what is it, the long hand of the law, I think, moves very slowly and we haven't yet caught up? Or what's, what's going on, really? I mean, why are we making always the same mistakes? Whoever wants to take that. that was yeah, not in the script. I'll, I'll take this. <laughs> so I think a lot of these coins that you refer to, like Squid Game token, you could lump in like Doge, you could lo- lump in like Pepe, you could lump in like a lot of these Shiba Inu. These coins, it's in my judgment that nobody has the expectation that there's any like technology behind it. There's no company. It doesn't feel like a security offering in the sense that you're not sort of making an investment so much as you are participating in this sort of decentralized casino. And you laugh, but, you know, there's nothing wrong with that as long as everybody has the expectation. It's only when somebody is buying on the pretenses that there is some kind of technology, that there is an entity behind it that's generating value, that's doing something, that you sort of get into the realm of fraud or or, or bad doing. And I think that it's goofy, and we can look at it and say, I wouldn't buy that. I wouldn't, you know, invest in these things. But I don't think there's anything wrong with it in particular either. Well, by the same token... No pun intended. Uh, casinos and gambling, that's somewhat of an extremely heavily re- regulated industry. So, it, It's true. And consumer protection has a role in the sense that if somebody has a problem, you would want to keep them from it. Because you know, people who launch these tokens or market them are essentially preying on people who have a gambling vice. But ignoring that and going back to the, is this like a security? Is there some kind of other role for regulation in the traditional financial asset sense. Um, I think for things like that, less so than for things like just really crappy but sort of technologically dubious projects. Anybody else? Well, I, I'll mention it's really hard to regulate human nature, right? And we have the essential tension of greed and fear. 
and uh, and we could put new regulations in place that address ICOs or that address NFTs or something like that. But having the regulation on the books is not the same as enforcing that regulation or being able to enforce that regulation. And you know, one of the things about blockchains is they are decentralized. Uh, they're going to run globally. They run in different regulatory environments. And they run in environments with very different levels of technological or financial literacy. So you're probably not ever going to regulate away uh, the risks of doing some of the things that, that people do. Uh, as kind of the old saying goes, uh, you know, in respect to laws, the, the good people don't need them and the bad people don't follow them. Uh, and, and that's not going to change. It's human nature. So I'd like to open the floor uh, for, for questions from the, uh, from the audience. Um, or comments on what was said uh, earlier, or you know, interactions that you may want to have. If not, I'll continue asking random questions from our panelists, and they are not prepared for that. So please step up. You promised us some good heckling. Yeah, I will. OK. But there's better hecklers in the, uh, in the audience. Do you mind if I just shout it from here? Sure. It's the end of the day, so yes. Um, I'll repeat it. So it's a, it's a very interesting uh, discussion. And I think um, what came to mind for me is are, are these products, like crypto financial products, um, more in the sense of like an FDA type of walled garden, like a drug or a bridge in the sense that they, they're almost physical products, just digital, right? There, there are rules of the network. So in terms of regulation, should we be um, regulating the rules of the network like you would regulate a pharmaceutical drug rather than regulating the human behavior that, you know, happens in the, let's say, like the second layer of financial interactions. Because I think those are already regulated through, like, you know, traditional whatever, wire fraud, etc. There's no regulatory body that regulates the base engineering of, of these networks, right? So is there a role for something like that? Taiwan, maybe? Uh, so FTC and SEC are more proactively now engaging in not about uh, uh, cryptocurrencies, about some algorithm-based products. So most finance products are invisible. So derivative is basically a set of mathematical formulations. And sometimes uh, now uh, uh, Wall Street companies are using uh, black box models to uh, uh, help uh, their uh, investment and their client's investment. And then FTC and SEC are more proactively asking companies to get inside the black box and then give some, whether it is in a model agnostic explanation or not, to give some explanation about the internal mechanisms so that SEC and FTC can verify whether there is anything risky or legal wrong there. And I think I can expect uh, government agencies to do something similar in the coming future when they think it's time. That's history. So I'll, I'll give you an example of something that I think about a lot, which is suppose that you have a bridge between two blockchains. And I'll point this out because this is like one of the riskier parts of the cryptocurrency infrastructure. There's like a lot of damage that happens at the edge of chains. So you have a bridge. Somebody makes it and they say, look, I made a wonderful bridge. Here's how it works. Here's my white paper. Go ahead and check it out. And then you use the bridge and it works for four months and then it falls apart. It rugs and everything in transit is lost forever. And so a lot of people are unhappy, hundreds of millions of dollars of value are destroyed. And you look at it and you say, whose fault is this? You know, somebody should have done something about this. Mm -hmm. Whose fault is that? Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. team who put it out never guaranteed you that this bridge would work. They said, look, I made a thing. Use it or don't. You used it. It ended up causing a lot of harm. Should somebody have regulated that? Should somebody have protected that? Is there an endorsement or a seal that we should be looking for? Mm -hmm. are, we, are we just waiting for, you know, verifiable... Uh, programming languages to catch up to the point where we can like put a stamp on it and say this is 
fulfilling the expected outcome of a bridge? Or do we just say, look, you know, as soon as you're on these networks, you're on your own. And it's a very different world than the one you're used to. You have to look out for yourself. There is, you know, nobody to hold your hand here. And sometimes that'll happen. But I'm going <clears> to... <throat> I'm going to riff a little bit on that because what you just said, I'm pretty, I had a big feeling of deja vu when I heard you say that because I remember like 20 years ago people talking about software liability and saying exactly the same thing. Like Microsoft and maybe some other companies, but I think Microsoft was the main instigator of that in the early 80s, uh, managed to put a clause in their licenses that say, hey, you buy our software, but you're on your own. No warranty, no liability whatsoever. We... You know, this thing may fall apart. If you're a tradesperson, like an electrician, a plumber, a someone, a civil engineer who builds bridges, you don't see that kind of liability regime. So is that, I mean, in your opinion, is, that, is, is this problem that we are facing with cryptocurrencies and blockchain projects in general a kind of outcome of the, you know, Uh, code fast and break things kind of mentality of software engineers and of like this whole byproduct of the uh, closed source and open source community or is it something that people are doing just because it's expedient? So I think it is. I think it's move fast and break things and I think that the anonymous nature where anybody can sort of log in and anonymously launch a project uh, makes it very difficult to create accountability because okay the bridge breaks a bunch of money is lost. Who do you blame? Nobody even knows who launched it in a lot of cases. So it makes things very difficult. And so I think there's room for essentially two kinds of outcomes here. One is that we sort of keep things that we have right now, which is very much, look, somebody made it. You could see the code. Maybe sometimes you can't. And beware, use it at your own risk. And then there's a second kind of entrant which says, look, we are compliant. We are going to register with the appropriate people. We are going to make ourselves accountable. And in doing so, we are going to stand behind this product And perhaps in doing so, we will convince uh, insurance underwriters to step in when something goes wrong. We are going to convince government agencies to help mitigate risk when it materializes. And these in a free market will command a premium. If you have two options, you know, you've got the fast and loose one, which is cheaper. And then you've got the one that your government that you trust is standing behind, which is probably more expensive, but maybe that's worth it to you. Uh, Rather, the question in... uh ethical theory and legal studies is uh, who should be held responsible when there is harm but there is no wrongdoer. And uh, different countries use different approaches. For instance, the U.S. and many European countries use the concept of a strict liability. It means that if there is some harm but it is practically difficult to identify who the wrongdoer is, then everybody share the burden. Or, oh, no, 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 not everybody. The, the, the manufacturer should pay for the remedy, even if the manufacturer is not at the pole. That's a strict liability. For instance, if you open the uh, tap of the Coca-Cola, sometimes, you know, it, you know, makes you blind. There is a case. And nobody's fault, but it happened, and then it is Coca-Cola's responsibility in the U.S., but New Zealand uses insurance approach. There's no strict liability. It's like a U.S. vehicle law. If you want to use a car, you have to necessarily buy insurance. If you use the insurance system to the blockchain, if you want to use DeFi-based product, you have to buy an insurance at the same time. That's the only way. But if you use a strict liability, then it is the organization, blockchain organization is responsible. So there may be many other approaches, actually. And I think it's an opportunity for researchers to think about, actually. So, I mean, I'll just mention that if you think about blockchain projects, their code, and for a long time, we've had code that it's very difficult to attribute to anyone. Uh, most of the internet runs on Linux. Um, but, you know, Linus Torvalds isn't in jail yet when something goes wrong. Uh, <clears throat> nobody's even found Satoshi yet, so he's, he's still free. Uh, you know, for a long time, we've had open source software models where there isn't a single company or even a single person responsible for the creation or the maintenance or the liability of that product. Uh, and, it, and it's a great model. And I think that a lot of blockchain projects are kind of closer to that model for the code. 
But I think there is a real opportunity here. You know, we were talking earlier about uh, kind of external regulation, maybe government regulation, something like that. But I think there's a real opportunity to build projects that do a better job of self-regulation and where the regulation is actually part of the code. And you can point to that as a feature of your project. So uh, I think that's you know, a, a really good area where there's still a lot of potential. Right, thank you. Any other questions from the audience or comments or um, input? Just to add, uh, you know, in, in the area of AI ethics, there are large conferences entirely dedicated to AI ethics, right? Mm -hmm. AI, ES, and uh, FACT, right. right? So those things. And, uh, and also, uh, fairness algorithms are very popular uh, topics here. But in the domain of the, uh, here, we don't see counterpart. I think that's a problem. And also, I'm, high, I'm really uh, uh, appreciate your attendance here. In typical conferences, you know, I teach business ethics, so I often invited to conferences about a tech, and then Typically, ethics and policy are the last two sessions. <laughs> and then not many people are. Most important people attending the session. Thank you. Hey, uh, do let me know if I'm asking a very stupid question. But isn't the fundamentals of regulation doing it in a centralized manner where we're trying to solve a decentralized problem with a centralized solution going against the fundamentals of what a blockchain and decentralized computing is supposed to be? Yes. So isn't there a fundamental disagreement in trying to do that because the people who are trying to do this from a decentralized perspective are going to push back against it, even though the benefits are there, but they won't accept it because this goes against the fundamentals of what we do. I mean, uh, pretty bad example, but isn't that kind of equivalent to trying to take gun rights away from Americans? Well, I, I mean, I, I think the... <clears throat> kind of the philosophical underpinnings of the first blockchain are fairly clear, uh, but those may not be, the, and certainly aren't, the philosophical underpinnings of, say, most regulatory agencies. So uh, we're, we're talking about different groups with different interests, and they're likely not going to have the same philosophy. So about the external policy regulatories, you know, there's no way you escape that part, right? You, you live in a certain country and jurisdiction, right? If you sell and buy some DeFi products here, then you have to incorporate in, let's say, state of Delaware. But I guess, you know, uh, just using an analogy, different companies have different decision-making processes. Code of conduct, different ideas. Patagonia's ideas about what is right decision internally is totally different from Wachovia. Yeah, I mean, like, this is a tough one for me because I've actually gone back and forth on this. I would say if you had asked me this question in 2014, I was very much of, like, the libertarian bend, which is, you know, leave us alone. Let us do our blockchain stuff. We have our, our own little niche here, and it's not like, you know, the existing world, and we're perfectly happy and that was like the very much like the code is law type of people where they said, look, we're, code governs us. That's the rules that we live by. And then over the years, that's broken down substantially. You know, we had the Dow hack in Ether and they said, well, you know, code's not really law. Like, you know, we lost a lot of money. And then you've got hacks of like mango market and it's like, well, you know, code's not really law. It sucks that we lost that money. So let's arrest this guy. And you know, well, you know, the wormhole bridge got hacked. And once again, I don't really think code should be law. I think we should do something about this. So I think it's fair that if, if we're going to intervene when it's convenient, um, we have to accept the fact that we don't live in a code is law world and, and that existing centralized regulations may have a role to play, especially in the sense of consumer protections, where you're dealing with an exchange where you don't even own cryptocurrency, you own exchange liabilities. And, and the fact that people's expectations of privacy, or not privacy, but of security weren't met, um, seems like a, a good opportunity for improvement. Yeah, it seems to me, I mean, listening to you all, it sounds like we're rediscovering that I mean, code is law is kind of a, it's a nice catchy phrase, but uh, 
law is law, right? And there's an exception handling mechanism for it, which is called, you know, a trial where human makes, uh, humans, sorry, make decisions based on an interpretation of what happened because law is imperfect and code is much more imperfect than law. I mean, code is perhaps less ambiguous, but it's riddled with bugs. And there are bugs also in law, right? I mean, people have been exploiting loopholes uh, all the time. Um, but then, you know, eventually somebody gets sued and... Uh, that's that's all this um, uh, history behind, you know, case law, basically, where you're like, yeah, okay, this is not what we really meant, right? Uh, take two. And we clarify it. And it seems like the 2014 situation that you described, I mean, I was, I was very much espousing it as well until I thought about it for five minutes and realized, come on, code is low. I mean, we are writing crappy code. We've been writing crappy code for like 80 years at this point, right? Um, the first bugs were like actual bugs in the 1940s. Um, so it seems like we're just rediscovering that and, and, and perhaps we are converging to something that is a little bit more akin to what we see in the more organic world. Um, anything else? We have a little bit over three minutes, so we can take one more question. Okay. Um, so the question I've been thinking about is, we say, so we, we can all agree that blockchain is a technology and it can be used for good or bad. And I think that's clear. But cryptocurrencies is the question that we don't have an opinion on. Like even when we teach it in classes, we tell students, this is a technology. We're not telling you it's good or bad. But when, if I teach something about security, I can have an opinionated thing. I can say, this is how you safely would use the internet. When I would imagine when doctors teach tobacco products, they will have an opinion that this is bad, even though people can choose and do it, but it's bad and it has regulation because it's bad and it has pictures that tells you how bad it is. With the research that's happening in this space, do you see that in some point in the future, researchers might reach consensus to say cryptocurrencies are good or bad and we will have an opinion on it? As long as crypto projects are funding research groups at universities, that will not happen. Like, full stop. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's the fact of the matter. Because the second that you teach your class and say, by the way, students, this is bad, that's it. <laughs> well, tobacco companies funded research. I'm, I'm very aware that tobacco companies have funded research. And I'm also very aware of the public opinion of this. So have, you know, companies that have funded research saying that, like, sugar consumption is fine. And, you know, Coca-Cola sponsoring all kinds of stuff. Um, look, so if, if we get to the point where we're saying, like, full stop, this is bad, um, that could happen, but that's very much in a, in a different kind of world than we have now. And I think it's fine for, for professors to inject their opinions. But what I meant in my initial comments is that by not saying anything at all, I think it kind of stands out as an endorsement um, of not just the technology, but of it as a financial investment, which is something we should be thoughtful of. Martin? Well, I mean, I actually think there's a, a different way to look at it. And, uh, and I think it's been pretty well defined in formal economics what the role of money is or what money is supposed to be. And it should have certain properties like a medium of exchange or a store of value. It should be durable. And I think we can evaluate, uh, I won't even say cryptocurrency, but digital currencies against those same standards. And I think you can say that there are relative benefits and drawbacks to digital currencies versus, say, fiat or physical currencies against some of these standards. So it, you actually can sit down with your class and say, you know, for this particular digital currency or cryptocurrency that we're looking at, if we evaluate it against these standards, here is where it is relatively better or relatively worse than something else that we want to compare it to. And I think that's a good way to have that discussion. And, you know, digital currencies clearly have a place in the future, uh, whether they're crypto-based or, you know, uh, central bank digital currencies. All that stuff still has, to, still has to be worked out. But I think there's clearly a role for digital currencies, and I think there is a way to talk about them and to compare them. Taiwan, you have the last word. There's a way to measure 
ethically, which cryptocurrency is better or worse than others? The ethical theory of political philosophy, contemporary field, is uh, discipline. So uh, there are, from an economics perspective, there are some standards we can use to, so, uh, but uh, we need to collaborate together to f develop a normative ethical framework. And then, hey, according to this framework, this cryptocurrency is ethically better than this one or worse than this one. Thank you. Well, I guess this concludes this, uh, this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Three of you.